we were happy to see each other. So I think for those who have been asking who is our next gen, uh, these are young scholars uh, who are based in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I know we also have some who are outside Sub-Saharan Africa and we usually emphasize on advanced yeah, master students, PhD candidates yeah. and early career researchers. And uh, what is the purpose of our research forum, our MAC Next Gen Research Forum, to stimulate scientific discussions among the next gen community on issues on sustainable yes. urban mobility, to provide an opportunity for young scholars to present and discuss their ongoing work with their peers with, within the community. And this is the reason why we are here. And we continue with the same come next year. And uh, to provide a meeting place for dialogue and exchange among young scholars and other stakeholders with the, within the community. I think I wanted to start with this so that we know why we are here, but I'm happy to bring on board my co-host, Robert Amunda from... Robert, are you there? Yes, I'm here, and, I'm here. Uh, I think as we do this, uh, we have um, our hosts, VREF, Jen Samaton and Karin. Karin, thanks so much for your support as always for your communications, for putting the message out there. I think we'll be talking about some short news as we'll be concluding. But at this moment, I want to bring on board Jen Summerton for a welcome remark. Jen, you are welcome. Thank you very much, Pasadena. Yes, my name is Jane Summerton. I think I know most of you, but those of whom I don't know, I'd like to say that uh, I'm a professor emerita and I am the scientific advisor to VREF. I'm standing in right today for my colleague, Henrik Normark, who is our director and who many of you know is very engaged in this program. Uh, he was called away at the last minute and he sends his very best to all of you. We're sorry he had to miss this great program today. So I'd just like to say as background to what Pashalin and Robert were saying, that one of VREF's absolute strongest priorities is to support the research and career development of next generation scholars, by which we mean advanced master students, PhD candidates, and early career researchers within five years of the degree. It kind of pervades all the work we do, and we're putting more and more emphasis on this. And we notice that within on the continent, you know, and within our program on MAC, that it's a particularly vibrant community. There's been lots going on, there's been a lot of engagements. We've had any, several research forums so far with different emphasis. Now we're going more to the type of research forum based on just what we're doing today, which is share the science, share what you're doing, get perspectives, make contacts. As you are presenting your work or discussing work, you will be in contact with other people in the room who will be able to get in contact with you. Maybe it's the basis for future collaborations, we don't know. So I'd just like to say welcome once again, and we're really looking forward to this program today. We have an excellent roster of speakers. And as we all know, the topic of active mobility is really, really vital today. And it's still under research, so it's really exciting that there's so many of you who are engaging with this topic. And I'd like to thank Pashalena and Robert in advance also for their work in, in putting this together and also leading us through today's session. So thanks very much. Over to you again, Pashalena. Thank you so much, Jen. I think it's been exciting to work with this team that is going to present today and even the discussions. There's a lot of energy among the next gen um, scholars or community. They are ready to present their work, they are ready to network, they are ready to publish, and they are ready to support one another. I think it was not a, a job, you know, to get the speakers, to get the discussants. It's been easy, and we really want to thank you. We are so happy that you've been able to put this together. Allow me at this moment to bring um, Robert from uh, Namibia to uh, take us uh, to the theme of the day and introduce our first presenter. Welcome, Robert. All right. Thank you, Pascaline. And uh, thank you, Jane, as well, for the very warm welcome. I think let me also just extend um, my welcome to all our participants today. And I'm so happy to see so many familiar faces as well as a uh, number of new faces. So this is for us and uh, let's all participate and let's all engage. Um, mostly, I try to emphasize that, especially in the previous forums, that the importance of the next gen initiative is to keep us engaged and to make sure that we network with uh, other young scholars. And VREF is really providing us this opportunity to make sure that we all have an equal platform to uh, blossom as young scholars within the global South. 
so I'm really excited to hear from the young scholars today who will give us some uh, insights into their projects. And that's within the theme of uh, exploring active mobility issues in uh, African cities. So some of the key elements we want to explore and we will get some of those insights from the presenters today are around understanding pedestrian behavior in African cities and then how we can apply some of that in-depth knowledge on uh, active mobility to improve the safety for our pedestrians on our urban streets and then what activities as well disrupt walking patterns and what tools can we apply to identify these patterns. So to help us uh, get along the way, perhaps just a bit of housekeeping, we'll have three presentations today with uh, 15 minutes allocated to the presenters and uh, five minutes to the discussants to just help stimulate our thoughts on the presentations and get us uh, going. And then after the presentations, we'll have a 30 minute plenary session where we can all query, we can all comment and then engage the presentations as well. So let's also make good use of the chat box for any questions and uh, comments while the presenters are presenting their work. Um, our first presentation will be by Jonathan Otumfo. Um, just a moment. Jonathan um, <clears throat> uh, is a PhD student of the University of Ghana in Accra. And uh, he's an urban transport geography with a focus on uh, road safety, active mobility, and uh, transport integration and electrical mobility. He holds an MPhil in geography and regional planning from the University of Cape Coast. And he has acquired wide experience in designing programs for road safety, transport policies, and environmental education for both government and uh, private sector. Uh, Jonathan is currently employed as a certified international uh, baccalaureate educator of geography and environmental systems and societies at the Tema International School. And uh, beyond teaching, he's exploring uh, drivers to pedestrian behavior towards non-motorized transport infrastructure. Uh, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Please share your slides with us. And um, we are so happy to hear your presentation. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And I must say, I'm so grateful to be amongst the midst of these scholars here to also share what I'm also working on over the years now. Okay, so as introduced by Robert, my name is Jonathan Otunfo Asante, a PhD student at the University of Ghana, and also working on pedestrianizing cities, examining pedestrian behavior in Accra. So what I'll be presenting today is just uh, one of my objectives that I've been working on. I went to the field not too long ago. So what I've, what I've gathered so far is what I'll be sharing with you. And I'm sure uh, I'll be getting some feedback, so which will actually help me to shape up my work. All right. So by way of starting, this is the outline of my presentation. And uh, to start, I must say that it has been argued by so many researchers that the fiscal activity is a very important determinant of well-being, disease prevention, and also improved health. However, a well-built urban environment would promote active mobility and also less reliance on automobiles, which will go a long way to improve the local and also the congested inner cities. So as indicated by Sue and also by in 2021, they acknowledge that there's a direct benefit of active transport to all, and also especially to individuals and also to the urban population. The UN also has standardized sustainable cities as one that provides safe, accessible, accessible, and also mo uh, mo mobility and affordable, sorry, uh, safe, accessible, and also affordable mobility to all. And this is a confirmation by uh, Zari and also uh, Zahari and also Afri in 2003, uh, 2013. The, it has also has been established that there is a relationship between the urban, the built urban environment and also the pedestrian mobility. When we talk of pedestrianization, we are looking at improving deliverability and also the 
we are, we are looking at the improving of livability of cities and also reducing the impacts of motorized, the damaging impacts of motorized traffic as indicated by the researchers indicated over there. It has also been indicated that most developed countries have actually done a lot of work when it comes to active mobility. And when it comes to our part of our world, uh, the low income and also moderate income countries, we also try our possible best. We have the case of Nairobi and Addis Ababa, Lagos, that are so much investing into the non-motorized tra transport infrastructure. It has also been indicated that uh, as much as uh, all these uh, facilities have been provided, the additions are not always adhering to this, making use of the footbridges, uh, the traffic lights, the bollards, the street lights, and also the refuge islands that have been provided by the government and also the stakeholders. It also, as I mentioned earlier, and also Zahan, Zahan in 2021 also indicated the relationship between the built up environment. We expect that mobility, all these infrastructure that have been provided will be provided, will be adhered and also be used by these uh, by pedestrians. By way of problem, uh, the United Health Organization also indicated that uh, mobility is a human right. However, there's a need for us to make sure that all facilities that are needed are provided for these uh, for positions. Uh, as mentioned by Sam in 2021, and so Stark uh, in 2020, uh, there's a need for us to improve on our road safety, make sure that positions are moving conveniently, uh, conveniently and also making sure that we are reducing, we are having, uh, uh, they are moving freely without any un unreasonable delays. In recent years, governments in the low income and also uh, middle income countries have shown commitment to reducing pedestrian injuries and also death by improving non motorized tra transport infrastructure. Record from the research National Road Safety Authority uh, in 2023 indicated that in 2022, about 980 pedestrians were injured, 225 pedestrians were also died. Uh, which is an alarming uh, of which that's not what we are advocating for over the years now. And so over the years, it has been indicated that there have been pressure from social social groups, journalists, and also researchers that government should provide all these infrastructures. Transport infrastructure on our roads. However, uh, there has been limited evidence to show, to explain the drivers of pedestrian behavior. No, we, we know that pedestrians are not always adhering to this or not using the fast infrastructure, but this study tends to find out the drivers, the things that are actually motivating or making the non user or the usage of all these transport infrastructure that have been provided in the country. The scope of my study is uh, it, it takes into consideration the income levels of the of uh, of the settlement. So I, I studied, I chose three areas in Ghana here: the high income levels, whereby we are looking at. Uh, the East, East Ligons, the cantonments, we also looked at the middle income areas that are Madina, Adenta areas, and also looked at the low income areas, that's the Nima, Mamobi areas, to find out how they react to all these uh, transport infrastructure that have been provided by the government. So the main aim of my study is to analyze the drivers of decision-making processes, underlining pedestrian behavior in greater Kerala metropolitan Assembly. So I'm not looking at the whole of Accra, but I'm looking at the functional Greater Accra, that's the Greater Accra Metropolitan Assembly. So these are some of the questions that I would like to uh, I would like to find answers to alongside my aims. So what is the nature and availability of transport infrastructure in uh, transport infrastructure in Gama? Does the Gama here stands for Greater Accra Municipal Assembly? Does the active transport infrastructure meet the demand of pedestrians? What informs the pedestrian to use or not to use the existing non-motorized transport infrastructure? Uh, what influences pedestrians to make optimal decision in the usage of non-motorized transport uh, MNT infrastructure? What does the regulations and also laws require the pedestrian to use? Uh, when we check our ally, as indicated earlier, our ally states that uh, pedestrians have the legitimacy to actually use rules However, there so there's the need for us to provide all this infrastructure to make the pedestrians safe, to move freely and also move conveniently to, to attain their services and also whatever they want to, uh, wherever they are going. I would also like to find out how does the regulatory environment affect the pedestrian behavior and also decision-making. 
for the purpose of this uh, this presentation, I'll be answering, I'll be finding answers on, I'll be giving a presentation on what informs the pedestrians to use or not to use the existing MNT infrastructure. That's the objective uh, research question three. So underpinning my research uh, is these, these are the models I'm trying to work with alongside to also find out how effects and also how I can explain the drivers I'm trying to find answers to. So I'm using the pedestrian level of service, which tends to measure the, and also evaluate the street facility and also infrastructure for pedestrians. I'm also looking at the normative pedestrian behavior theory. I'm looking at the theory of reason action and also use, uh, explain use the built environment effects to explain, uh, or to also explain the availability of transport infrastructure and how the urban environment is uh, prohibiting also encouraging uh, pedestrians to use the MNT infrastructure. So uh, moving straight into what I've found so far, uh, as I mentioned, I'm still on the field, or letting the data. So the data that I have, which is sufficient enough for one, Area that's the mid one middle uh, income earning areas that's at Madina Denta area. So that's what I have so far. And from my findings so far, I, I'm not making any conclusions yet because I'm not done with what I'm doing uh, until I'm done. Then I can make a final conclusion on that. So, so far, 62% uh, of, the, of the respondents are male. And I try to also find out how long do they travel in terms of their age groups. And go to understand that the majority of them are the youthful population oh, that between the ages of between the ages of 16 to uh, 45. But the majority of them uh, between 36 to 45 uh, are able to travel between these distances 50 to 500 meters to one kilometer. Uh, but to, in total, I, I, I have investigated about 30 and uh, 16 of them, 16 percent of them. To look at uh, this, uh, also to also look at uh, are there enough pedestrian walkway in the neighborhood? Uh, these are the questions I find out from them, and from the distance that they covered, about um, thirty six percent of those who cover distance between five hundred meters to one kilometer are uh, are able to. Uh, sorry, about thirty two percent of the respondents mentioned who travel between five hundred meters to one kilometer mentioned that there are no. Uh, pedestrian walkways in their neighborhood. Likewise, uh, uh, I think between for those who travel between 30, 3, three kilometers and more, that's ten percent indicated that yes, there are uh, pedestrian walkways in their areas. And from what I indicated by observation, by observation checklist, I got to know that yes, in these kilometers, it's likely there's a likelihood that you may come across a transport infrastructure when it comes to, uh, especially when it comes to walkways. Uh, so it's it's not actually surprising to see such a result from them. And also, it's also indicated that those who travel less than 500 meters, which actually is one of the uh, one of the predominant travels among uh, pedestrians, those 500 meters, uh, less than 500 meters, 10% mentioned that 10, 10% mentioned that there's no walkways in their environment or where they work. To talk about the friendliness of uh, frequency, also the pedestrian walkway, uh, how often they use, um, uh, 48% mentioned that they only use when it's available. They only mentioned that 48%, that which actually is the majority of respondents so far, mentioned that they will only use the pedestrian walkway when it's available. It means that there's a willingness from our pedestrian that if infrastructure is being provided, they are ready to use them. And also 30% also mentioned that they often use it. it, means that it's not always the case. And which also uh, has been represented here that 22% mentioned that they don't often use the um, pedestrian walkways. Looking at their built environment so far, the, what I've uh, tried to find out, so looking at the friendliness of the pedestrian trails in the urban areas, uh, the majority that's 30% mentioned that it's friendly to work on. And uh, 28% also mentioned that uh, using even the walkway exposes them to danger. And these are some, the next question that I'm trying to find out is what are some of the dangers that it poses them to? And it's, uh, it's helped me to, to reshape my questionnaires and also know to find out what the dangers they are exposed to so that if there are ways to also uh, to address it, also recommend for uh, advocates or stakeholders to work on. It's also mentioned that 26% uh, also mentioned that uh, the walkways are being occupied by traders 
uh, which is actually uh, predominant uh, in most of my observation in Medina Delta because Medina is a very commercial area and there's a likelihood of all these things to be happening there. As I mentioned, I'm not making conclusions yet until uh, I'm done with my total sample. We also try to look at the status of sidewalks in the neighborhood, uh, of which the majority majority of the respondents uh, mentioned that it's not well maintained. Uh, and a few just mentioned that this maintained. I also try to look at um, the presence of uh, these, whether they are, we have pedestrian uh, signals, we have bicycle lanes, we also have trees, which also is movement easily, also makes uh, movement uh, comfortable. 52% uh, mentioned that in some areas they do have pedestrian signals, and 38% that mentioned that there's nothing of such that happens. When it comes to bicycle trees, 70% mentioned that no, there's nothing of such that exists in their areas. For trees, which has been advocated by most researchers, that we need them when it comes to realization, when you travel for a very, when you work for a very long time, for a short time, you should have a, a realization or a comfortable or an accommodation for your travels to even uh, when it comes to the disabled uh, disabled disabled uh, persons should we also have the opportunity to also relax and even trees for to provide 78 percent mentioned that no nothing of such is present in their neighborhood to conclude with what i have so far i also try to find out uh, why they are using or why they don't use the footbridges because over the years for some time now uh, some years back, uh, there was a serious advocate for the provision of food bridges in our areas, in especially in those areas where because injuries, traffic injuries, and also uh, deaths were increasing. Government was able to provide it, although we had questions about it as to the engineering aspect. But to find out from the pedestrian why they are not using it, forty percent mentioned that uh, there are no food bridges in their areas. Uh, and I understand because I also looked, I did not only look at the main roads, I also looked at the inner, uh, inner the inner part of the cities to also find out uh, their behavior. So uh, it's not surprising to see that. And for those who were able to indicate that there are food bridges in their areas and why they are not using it, they mentioned that it's far from their crossing point. It also brings out the, defi the, defi uh, the deficiency in engineering, also trying to solicit the views of pedestrians or members when it comes to the, the building of transport infrastructure in that area. So if it's far from their area, then there's a likelihood that they may use, they may not use their footbridges and they may just risk their lives causing or using those to uh, other areas. For few also mentioned that it's too long for them to use. Uh, for, I have, there's, there's, there, there's this, um, I, um, I don't know what to, uh, cliche around that, and most now the food bridges in Ghana has now become a, a jog a point for people to jog to do exercise because it's long enough for you to 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 do your exercise and so it's not also surprising to come up with this though as I mentioned it's still at the early stages to also find out what is actually going on also find out I also tried to find out from the pedestrian why they are not using zebra crosses and I think uh, forty five percent also mentioned that uh, there are no zebra crosses in their areas, um, which actually is the majority. They mentioned that there are no zebra crosses in their areas. So uh, this is what I have so far with my study. But what I'm doing currently concurrently with the data collection is to map out transport infrastructure in Accra. I've been able to list all the infrastructure that uh, is required uh, to make up a complete uh, built-up environment. And I'm using a software by which was a uh, um, so, uh, which was uh, created by one of the uh, special company, Akus Special in East, in East. They're going to help me to map, to map out all these features, and I'm going to use this to also look, check out the population. Uh, that's uh, looking at the pedestrian count, how they are using it, and the population in the area. As so whether it's enough, is, is it wide enough? It doesn't meet the standard that uh, UN is requiring us to uh, to provide for the pedestrians. I'm also trying to audit the streets uh, through this uh, mapping out uh, to find out whether this infrastructure, some are in good shape, are they posing dangers to the pedestrian or not? And also, I'm also, uh, I'll also be looking at uh, qualitative data collection. Uh, I'll try to investigate uh, to find out from their perspective, to find out um, from the pedestrian and also the stakeholders, their views, 
and to also uh, yeah, their concerns and, and how they are also behaving towards the availability of the MNT that has been provided. So uh, let's say thank you very much. Uh, this is what I have so far, and uh, I'm hoping that I'll get enough uh, feedback and also to shape up this uh, presentation that I have. Thank you very much. Wow, wow. Thank you so much, Jonathan. We really enjoyed your presentation. And I saw quite some similarities in Nairobi or in Kenya, and I'm sure the people in the room uh, can relate to your presentation. I would like to bring on board Marcy Edna, who has looked at your presentation, read your work, and uh, she is going to give some uh, comments to your work. And uh, as uh, Marcy, uh, Marcy comes in, allow me to introduce her. Marcy Edna is a transportation engineer. Uh, I think Jonathan, you can uh, pull down your presentation. With a specialized fo focus on sustainable transportation, active mobility, electric mobility, and intelligent transport systems. Masi holds a master's degree in transportation engineering. Throughout her career, she has acquired valuable experience in road planning, design, and construction across various government and private institutions. Currently, Masi is an assistant lecturer at the Technical University of Kenya, and she imparts her expertise in these areas to her students. Beyond her teaching role, she's deeply involved in research and enjoys mentoring young engineers. That is Masi for you. Masi, you have five minutes, minutes to discuss uh, Jonathan's presentation. You are much welcome. Thank you so much, Pascaline, for the intro. Yeah, so I, I listened to what Jonathan talked about and I had a lot of comments to make regarding his uh, research. Uh, for Setters, I did feel like he's handling a lot of information at the same time because I feel like at the end of the day, I felt like there was a lot that he's trying to investigate. There's built environment, there's the pedestrian behavior. Also, he's trying to map out the infrastructure. So I feel like it's a lot of things happening. I understand it's a PhD project and he has to cover a lot in terms of his, the research, but I still feel like I wish he focused more on like a specific aspect of the pedestrian behavior because also he's talked about foot bridges again and he's talking about the infrastructure because at some point I, I got confused because I, I didn't hear a lot about the mapping which was kind of what was coming out a lot in his abstract. He mentioned the mapping more than he talked about the other aspects. So the other aspects that he has mentioned that is to do with the qualitative and the quantitative data is what he has focused more on right now compared to the GIS mapping aspect, which is quite important, especially for this kind of research, because that is what influences the behavior of the pedestrians. And I also do feel like I would want him to explore uh, analyzing pedestrian behavior beyond just questionnaires and uh, qualitative analysis in terms of responses from the road users, because I feel like at the moment, we are using a lot of technology. We have an AI person in the room. Maybe he can give their opinion, but I feel like uh, right now, a lot of people are doing pedestrian behavior studies using uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and they're trying to understand more in terms of what the pedestrians prefer using what we call computer vision. So I feel like if he probably had also looked into other aspects of pedestrian behavior analysis beyond just asking questions to the pedestrians, he would get a better idea of what the pedestrians want in terms of their infrastructure. So for me, I, I on my part, I just feel like it's a really, really good PhD topic. It's a really good presentation and I like what he has done so far but I would just like to give my input and request maybe that he tries to bring out the aspect of mapping more than just the qualitative and the quali quantitative aspect that he's brought about. But generally, I feel like I've gotten a good, good idea of the metropolitan area. And also, if I, before I forget, I also wanted to understand what is his study area, because I feel like it's a very huge area to study. So even the pedestrian counts are going to be very hectic. It's gonna be very expensive to do a study in such a big area, you know? And also what kind of, uh, how is he zoning the area, you know? We want to understand like what uh, 
uh, percentage of the respondents are coming from this zone, what percentage of respondents are coming from this zone, because it's a big metropolis. So we need to understand clearly where the most of the respondents come from, because that will give us a big idea or a better picture of what is happening in the metropolitan area in Ghana. So that is really what I wanted to bring out in terms of the research, maybe just a lesser study area and a bigger focus on the infrastructure which leads to the behavior that is what we are trying to quantify here. And maybe more use of technology like computer vision, videography, that would also give him a better idea of the behavior of the pedestrians. Thank you so much, Pascaline. That is mostly what I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcy, for those comments. And just a quick one uh, before it escapes my attention. Uh, Jonathan, your questions, they seem to be many. I think some can be put together so that you're not appearing to be doing so many things. They can be put together. But I'll uh, stop there for now. I think you'll hear much from the rest of the, of the, of, of the room. Mm -hmm. And uh, allow me at this moment to call upon Robert to introduce our second presenter who is Polycap. I know Polycap is struggling with connection. I hope uh, Polycap, you can hear us. Uh, over to you, Robert. Well, thank you, Pascaline. And thank you to Jonathan and Mercy for the wonderful presentation and discussion. Um, the next presenter is Chebe Polycap, who holds a master's degree in human geography from the University of Yaounde, uh, Cameroon. And he has a professional master's degree in international cooperation Humanitarian Action and Sustainable Development from the International Relations Institute of Cameroon. And that is in at the University of Yaounde um, in Cameroon. Jabe is currently pursuing his PhD at the Faculty of Architecture and Town Planning, uh, Technion Israel Institute of Technology. And uh, as a doctoral student at the Fair Transport Lab, Jabe's research interest is on promoting inclusive transport with a focus on inclusive road and street designs and walking as a mode of transport in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Chebe, uh, you're welcome. Please share your slides with us and uh, we are looking forward to your presentation. Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much, Robert. Let me share my slides. Polycap, if you have challenges, yes. we can help you to share your screen. Yeah, if you can't, sorry for that. Okay, if you can bring down your screen. Okay, let me stop sharing instead. I will try to share. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Just a moment, let me... Okay. No, it is. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So just let okay. me know when we go to the next slide. Okay. Thank you very much. Maybe you'll just be following me as I'll be presenting. Thank you very much, Robert, for the kind introduction. I'm very grateful and excited to present our ongoing research work to the team today on behalf of a large team headed my by my own supervisor, Professor Claire Martins. And of course, you permit me start this uh, presentation informally by taking you down memory lane into the journey of my life and how much I have come so far when it comes to working. You can just take the next slide, please. So I was born and raised, next slide, I was born and raised in a small village in the Northwest region of Cameroon, where I started my primary school journey. And uh, as a young kid, uh, you, next slide, please. 
Okay. As a young kid, we were always excited, especially when the when it was end of the school day and you could see us running back home, very excited, sometimes barefitted without minding what was ahead of us, walking down on a road that was similar to this. After my primary school day came my secondary school day, and this time I had to walk triple the journey that I was doing during my primary school days. Next slide. And uh, of course, during this period, I was working in an environment that was similar to this for over an hour in order to get to school on a daily basis. And uh, I'll fast forward now to my days as an adult. Next slide. As an adult, I was living in the outskirts of Yaoundé. My house was somewhere up the hill there. And on a daily basis, I had to walk down the road right across, next slide, right across to the build up area where I had to take an alternative mode of transport, which was usually a motorbike in order to get out of the neighborhood. And out of the neighborhood, I could choose to either continue with a motorbike or a taxi or a paratransit bus, depending on where I was going to that day. That was my journey on a daily basis and the journey of many other people in Sub-Saharan Africa who do not own cars, but need to travel to different destinations on a daily basis. Now, getting back to the project, urban roads enablers or barriers to walking. Before I start, Next slide. Next slide. I would like you to take a look at this image. What do you think about this road? Do you see this road as an enabling road or a barrier? What do you think about the road? Next road. Next slide, please. Take a look at this other image. What do you think about this road? Is it an enabling road to you or a barrier? And then this other last road. Equally take a look at it. How do you see this road? Is it comfortable for walking or you think that it is a barrier for walking? I am going to come back to these roads in the course of the presentation. Now, as we all know, much has been said about walking, seeing walking as the primary and widely used mode of transport. Even for those who have cars, sometimes they prefer to actually walk, especially during congested periods. But unfortunately, walking too is one of the underrated modes which has been marginalized in terms of policy planning and implementation, especially within the sub-Saharan African context. Next slide. It is against this backdrop that we decided to embark on this topic. Next slide. With the aim at assessing how these things road designs they actually impact the mobility accessibility and livelihoods of residents which, who are living along links in urban areas of sub-Saharan Africa. Next slide. To realize this objective, we had to select three case studies, including Bamenda, Cameroon, Kigali, Rwanda, and Cape Town, South Africa. Bamenda, Cameroon actually features in this study as an urban area with basic road designs Next slide, as we can see on the image, where we have a completely basic route, but with diverse users. Next slide. The next case study city is Cape Town, South Africa, which is selected to represent an urban area with a motorized road design that is modeled after global north cities. Next slide. And the last case study city, which was selected for this road is Kigali, Rwanda, which is an urban area striving towards a more inclusive road design. As we can see on the image where the road has been separated for different users, including a pedestrian lane, a bicycle lane, and uh, the carriageway with a median that is separating both directions. Next slide. To actually realize this, uh, study, we are going to select two arterial roads in each case study city. 
And uh, these two arterial roads will be surveyed using a checklist in a bit to identify the different road design elements that are either serving or not serving pedestrians. This will be followed with interviews that will be conducted with residents living along these roads in actually to, act, in actually to find out how these roads actually impact their mobility, accessibility, and uh, livelihoods. And this last stage will be a focus group discussion with professionals and decision makers, which we aim at deliberating and designing a pathway that can lead to a more inclusive road design in sub-Saharan Africa. For the last month, was the month of September and October, I was in Kigali, Rwanda, to actually conduct the first case study, and I'm going to be sharing with you some preliminary findings from our field study in Rwanda. Based on the design, we actually selected two arterial roads, and the first arterial road that we selected was the Nyabubogu Gatsiata Road, which is along the Kigali Kampala corridor. This road is actually selected in this study, as I said. The road actually has two stretches, which is there is a modern stretch of the road, which is more inclusive, having a pedestrian lane, bicycle lane, and a carriageway. But there's something remarkable about this image that if you look at it keenly, you will see that despite the provision of the bicycle lanes, cyclists have decided not to use this lane and they prefer to actually share the carriageway with other motorized modes. However, this was not actually our interest on this stretch of road, but the image and other uh, observations that we did actually caught our attention. The area that was actually our, in, our area of interest is the next stretch of this part of the road, which is more basic. Next slide. Actually having pedestrian paths on both sides, and then there is a carriageway, a one times one carriageway road, and uh, with other facilities along these roads. Next slide, please. Along these roads, there is equally a designated bus stop and uh, other facilities. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yes. These roads equally, as we discovered, has some mishaps some of the pedestrian parts, we discovered that if you look at the previous image, the, the concreted pavets there are broken and pedestrians actually struggle in order to navigate these portions. And then when we equally look at this road, it actually has zebra crossings, but most of the zebra crossings are old and almost invisible, as we can see on this image, and actually crying for renovation. The next image that caught our attention is uh, this other, the behavior of pedestrians on these zebra crossings. If we look at these pedestrians on these zebra crossings, even though they are priority areas for them, they cross the road with a lot of consciousness in them, very keen looking at the impact of an incoming vehicle so as to avoid any traffic crash. Next image. And then this other image, we see this agricultural worker struggling to cross this road at an unregulated point, which is along the modern stretch that I actually described earlier. What caught our attention here was that this stretch was over a distance of 1,700 meters. And unfortunately, along this distance, there was just one zebra crossing. And in order to avoid long day two movements along this stretch, most pedestrians were seen crossing these roads at unregulated points, as we see this agricultural worker looking on incoming vehicle to cross at a wrong position along this road. Next slide. Then we equally had other activities that we observed along the road, like motorbike cleaning and tire polishing. Next one. There were other livelihood activities like this mobile money operators, which were found along the road. Next slide. We had other informal activities like shoe repair. As we see here, this is one of the shoe repairers that we actually interviewed. Next slide. Now for the second case study road that we selected was the Rwandex on tube road. And this other road was a more inclusive road that is in line with current design standards in Kigali, having a double carriageway designated pedestrian path and uh, 
a median. Next slide. Of course, this other road equally had zebra crossings, which are very visible and new. Next slide. This junction caught our attention because most re respondents reported that there were actually no zebra crossings here and no traffic lights to control traffic, but pedestrians were forced to move along this place, sometimes finding it difficult or crossing the road at unregulated points, as we see on the image. Next slide. We equally had this other image that caught our attention, the iron barrier beside the wall in which Accessibility from the neighborhoods to this sidewalk was actually restricted by these iron barriers and pedestrians were forced to move towards the extreme end of these extreme barriers to actually access the road. Next slide. We equally saw this other image of this police lady who was on a traffic device capturing or monitoring uh, vehicle speeds along this road. Next slide. And then, we had this other image of this cyclist who was on the pedestrian path, the people that are described because inside work friction for pedestrians. Next slide. For the findings, first on those on mobility, we found that walking was the dominant mode of transport in the city with most people walking over short distances. Walking mostly was due to financial constraints and for sports. However, there were reports of frequent invasion of sidewalks by cyclists and occasionally by motorbikes, as we saw on the previous image. Next slide. For the findings on accessibility, most walking destinations were reported of within 10 to 30 minutes. Respondents reported that they had friends and families on both sides of the road, but meet less frequent. They also reported the cases of cyclists, motorbikes, and heavy trucks that were sources of discomfort during walking, making some of them to cross less. Next slide. For livelihood findings, most of the respondents reported the official restriction of informal livelihood activities along the road, and this was actually visible in the Sonatu Rwandex road where we could not identify these activities. Then they reported a decline in business activities due to low exposure and the increase in house rents, especially those along the Rwandex Sonatu road after the construction of the road. Next slide. For further findings, small business owners on the Gatsiata Road reported that most of their customers were local residents who worked to their business premises to buy from them. And those on the Rwandex streets, they reported that most of their customers were actually car owners, especially business, those that had business premises with parking spaces around them. Next slide. For the findings on the road as a place, most respondents reported that they do not spend time on the street because they were not actually attractive and appealing to them. They identified joking as the only form of sport that was common on both streets. They also reported that streets were not used for social activities like funerals, marriages, and birthdays. Respondents also reported the continuous existence of traffic crashes on both the basic road and the, the modern road that we actually surveyed. For suggestions, they suggested the road that they suggested the widening of the road, especially the Garciata Road. They equally suggested the installation of traffic lights and road signs on both streets, as well as the provision of toilets along streets for road users. They also suggested the provision of rest stops, benches, and shelters, especially for pedestrians who were walking along this road. In conclusion, we discovered that. Walking actually remains the dominant mode of transport in the city, but is hindered by some of the road design elements that are, to an extent, a barrier to walking and an enabler, as well as cyclists, motorbikes, and trucks too, that were identified as sources of discomfort for pedestrians. Respondents, however, were positive about the recent mode separation in the city and called for enhanced working facilities. However, they also saw motorization as the future of transport 
for discussions, we discover that the car bias is not only prevalent among stakeholders, but also among the urban poor who do not own cars, yet see motorization as the future. However, when we look keenly, we discover that low motorization levels remain inevitable for decades to come, as we are not sure of a generation where everybody will be able to own cars. And if everybody is to own cars, we are not sure that everybody will be able to drive, considering children, the elderly, and the old. We therefore strongly uh, suggest the shift from the strut designs that are that is roads that are struggling to act both as streets and roads at the same time failing in both functions towards the design of more inclusive roads designs in sub-Saharan Africa that can meet the needs of the different road users. Thank you so much. This is what we could share for the moment and we are going to, or oh, if you have any questions, you can ask when the time comes. Sorry for the inconveniences. Thank you very much and waiting for your questions. Back to you, Robert and Pascaline. All right, thank you very much, Chebe. Uh, that was quite an insightful presentation. Uh, sorry for, for that inconvenience as well. And I think you did quite a good job in uh, presenting despite the slides being controlled here. Um, Pascaline, the floor is yours to introduce the discussion. Wow. Thank you so much. The images were amazing. They were great. And I'm happy to bring Nama, who is going to give justice to those images. Nama is going to tell us whether the designs are enabling or they are, <laughs> they are barriers. So Nama, as you come on board. So Nama is a transportation engineer. The house is full of transport engineers, yeah? who is currently pursuing her PhD studies at the University of Pretoria, South Africa. Her PhD work is focusing on the bus rapid transport system design approach for unequal societies in developing countries. Her area of specialization includes sustainable transport, public transport planning, transport modeling, discrete choice modeling, travel behavior and road safety. Nama has previously worked on various research and consulting projects, including a VREF position paper on the public Pascaline, I don't know if it's just me or, or if we lost. I, I cannot hear you, Pascaline. Could we check? Uh, system design and models. Okay. And the updating of the comprehensive. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. sorry, sorry. I don't know where you lost me. I don't know. So, Nama, uh, please come on board and um, give justice five minutes. Uh, tell us whether the designs are also similar in your country, whether they're enabling or their barriers. You are welcome. Thank you, Pascaline. Uh, hi, everyone. And thank you, Chede, for the interesting presentation. Um, and yes, uh, thank you for the for taking us through your journey, you know, growing up. I can totally relate to that, you know, even in um, our countries. I think that we actually, you know, have uh, the same type of roads and we have, you know, most people growing up the same way, uh, children walking to school and then back home, walking long distances. And this actually, you know, calls for um this important discussion on working as a mode. You know, indeed, working is the most important uh, mode of transport because everyone works uh, at some point. And um, we know that in Africa, you know, we have um, most cities uh, having the trips being made by walking, uh, maybe between 50% to 90% of the trips are actually walking trips in uh, African cities. So we have you know, this gap uh, where we need to more research being conducted and even the implementation part when it comes to the infrastructure. So from this uh, three uh, case studies that we have seen, um, indeed uh, we see um, the infrastructure being barriers to walking. And this also relates to the previous presentation uh, when they were asking people 
people, you know, questions about uh, whether they walk or they do not walk and why. And we see that, you know, where there is not adequate uh, infrastructure or just decent infrastructure, walking actually becomes a risk because you see people walking along the uh, vehicle roads, which is very dangerous. And this is what is leading to, to more pedestrian crashes and fatality, fatalities. So over the past few years, you know, in most African cities, we actually see an increase in pedestrian fatalities because the drivers, you know, most of them, they're speeding or some are on their phones. And at the end of the day, uh, when there's an accident, uh, it's the pedestrian uh, who gets to die. So this is actually a very important um it's a very important research, especially in the African context. And um, maybe just some of the few questions that I can have uh, for you, Chebe. Uh, how do you intend maybe to um, further your research? This is good, you've got you know, three case studies. Are you intending maybe to expand it you know, to more cities? And have you also compared you know, these findings with other findings, maybe from other case studies that have been conducted? Because I know that you know, we actually have uh, more similar characteristics in, in most African countries. And um, yet uh, we talk about sustainable uh, transport, you know, looking at the issue of the climate change mitigations and working actually is, uh, you know, an important part of that. So this calls uh, for the politicians, for the governments, you know, to actually um, look at implementing these measures because you know what we are seeing uh, these barriers we need to actually implement good infrastructure so that we can enable you know people can actually walk because you know that if we have good infrastructure people can actually walk and looking at uh, children uh, specifically the parents they will not um, feel you know uh, safe for their children to be working when there is no infrastructure and yet most of them they walk to school every day and back so so uh, how can we actually uh, ensure that uh, maybe uh, we have an effective uh, or efficient implementation of this uh, pedestrian walkway infrastructure in our cities so that we just uh, we move from just talking about this but then to working the walk and uh, because you know, people are actually dying every day. And I just feel like, you know, this is something that we need to implement as soon as possible. How can we um, achieve this? How can we push maybe the politicians as transport engineers and planners? How can we find a way of, you know, having to implement uh, this infrastructure so that we can have an inclusive uh, transport system, sustainable transport system in our cities, you know, both in the urban areas as well as the rural areas. So, yeah, I think um, that was uh, interesting. And yes, I do agree that most of our roads, they are actually barriers and uh, people actually end up, they actually end up using their cars, you know, to go to work because they feel like they are not, you know, they are not safe when they are working. So it's just all, you know, all these issues combined, the issue of safety and the issue of this poor infrastructure, all these crashes, it's just um, hindering, you know, uh, the progress that you want to make when we are preaching the issue of sustainable mobility and working as a mod. So those are my key takeaways. Thank you. Um, all right. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nama. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've had uh, from our first presenter talking about pedestrian behavior, our behavior, because we are all pedestrians. We've also had uh, from Polycap uh, about enablers or barriers to walking. And our final presenter is going to tell us about how we predict, predictors of disruptive activities to walking. And uh, Prince Kwame, you can begin sharing the screen as I introduce you. So Kwame is a transport geographer, uh, but focuses on the mobility issues of vulnerable population groups like children, women, persons with disability, and the aged. This interest dominates in his PhD studies at the University of Cape Coast, where he explores the transport-related social exclusion among commuters with visually impairment and the physically challenged. Kwame, we are happy to hear from you about you know, the forgotten population, the PWDs and other special needs people. All right. Kwame, you're uh, welcome to make your presentation. Thank you very much, Pascal. Um, 
once again, um, I'm presenting on a non-familiar topic, um, destructive activities to work in. And I want to believe that even though we largely look at user experiences and the various conditions under which people work, one of the key things that characterizes working within our various settings, our various activities that distract our attention and also takes us off the street for a while. So I will not overemphasize the importance of working. And so if you look at national statistics across the African continent, you realize that working forms um, a fundamental part of our life. And in the case of Ghana, just about 65% of all Ghanaians actively work to various opportunities at one point in time or the other. Inherent in this important function is the fact that these same working activities comes along with numerous health and environmental benefits. And if you pay close attention, you realize that the health benefits is derived from working ability to reduce cardiovascular and obesity related diseases. On the other hand, environmental benefits comes in the fact that working does not burn fossil fuel, does not produce noise, a lot of it, for which reason the environment stands to benefit most if people actively benefit from working. But for my part of the world, Africa and Ghana in particular, in cases where people advocate increased working experiences, the incidence of risk associated with these working tax are also increased proportionally, particularly within areas where traffic enforcement is quite weak or poor, or in areas where the design of the built environment does not necessarily factor the needs of pedestrian in question. And so if we are advocating for people to walk and all of these conditions do exist, then vis-a-vis -vis, we are virtually saying that we are drawing people closer to their grave because all of these factors would actually lead them to various incidents of crash or injury as seen in the picture. But if we put these statistics across the board, the WHO indicates that virtually two out of five people who walk across Africa are neither in a bus or on a motorcycle. What it means is that two out of five people who encounter any form of crash or are exposed to this danger are people who walk on an everyday basis like you and I. But if we should disaggregate this data on a continental level, look at Africa, Europe, um, the US and other parts of the world, you notice that the US and Europe have more vehicle and a wider transport network compared to Africa. However, Pedestrian crashes recorded in Africa way outweigh that of the US and Europe. As you can see, whilst Africa records about 40% pedestrian casualties and crashes, the Europe and the Americans record around 22 and 27%. And if you bring it even further to Ghana, you realize that pedestrian crash in Ghana is close to the average for Africa, for which reasons we need to take a critical look at the various conditions for which people work within Ghana. But the discourse about pedestrian casualties and injuries, it's not all about whether or not there are sidewalks or whether or not there are enforcement, as a lot of literature has indicated all of this in the past. But one key thing the literature keeps popping up across the time relates to risky in traffic walking behavior, particularly when it comes to the use of digital technology in order for us to stay connected and active. And these digital technology and other risky behavior like drunkenness, conversing, um, making phone calls and et cetera, put a lot of Africans, particularly Ghanaians, to the risk of danger, which simply implies that in some of the cases, a lot of pedestrians in Ghana in particular work distracted, for which reasons we decided to embark on this exploratory study to actually look at various predictors that inform the extent to which Ghanaians work distracted in Ghana. But again, on that tangent, the group or the research team noticed that the issue of destructive activities within the transport environment is not new, as the literature has also been very, very um, prominent on destructive activities to walk in. And so we've seen a lot of literature on walk, so on driving, and how making phone calls or receiving phone calls have dire implications on driver's ability to stay connected. Looking at this, the team noticed some gap when it comes to the production of knowledge 
particularly with respect to destructive activities to working within the Ghanaian context, for which we decided to also explore the issue and offer some level of knowledge on the state of this within the central business district of Accra in Ghana. So why exactly did we do the study? We conducted the study within the central business district of Accra and for a lot of reasons. One of the key reasons was the fact that this area comprises about 57.6% of all traffic injuries that occur within 2022, making the CBD of Accra the top most area of concern when we want to focus on pedestrian crash. Again, this area also constitutes the national capital of Ghana, drawing onto it a lot of foot traffic as people would draw in to conduct various activities and move back into the hinterlands or whichever area they came from within the day. Engaging participants for the study required some considerations. And for that matter, the study targeted pedestrians who were aged 16 years and above. The reason is that the minimum age of consent for Ghana is 16 years, for which reason we thought that 16 years would be a good age for people to actually give a better assessment of their working experience and an extent for which they engage in various activities that distract their attention. Using various sampling activities, we ended up selecting 400 participants who were conveniently selected at various shopping destinations between, within the central business district. Indeed, getting respondents to stop along the way while they are on their busy schedule was quite difficult as they were more concentrated on getting to their destinations. However, identifying these key five destination spots within the areas offered a good opportunity for us to briefly stop them for a while, introduce the study to them, and also take their contact number if they agree to participate in the study, for which reason we deployed Kobo Toolbox, which was an online data collection platform. So once you agree to participate in the study, we take your number and send you the instrument on WhatsApp hoping that we would administer and also fill the instrument for us. Of course, we had to do this many times because not everyone who agreed actually completed the instrument within the expected time for the data collection. The research instruments largely comprise three key items. The social demographic characteristics, which was the first portion. The second portion looked at a ranking of various destructive activities to work in where we allowed respondents to give us an overview of top 10 activities that they are likely to engage in when working within the central business district of Accra. Then the third part of the study looked at the various extents to which respondents engage in each of these 10 activities, destructive activities to work in, and that took the form of a Likert skill question. This offered us the opportunity to also engage in the binary logistic regression, where we aggregated the data to produce a two item dependent variable. So it was one, susceptibility of engaging in destructive working, whether it was high or low, depending on the value for which we decided to look at. Who are the people we engage with? This is a brief overview of the participants. So we had virtually 51.5% of them who were male, and that was a clear representative of the economically active population of Accra and Ghana in particular, even though we had a higher general female population. Among the marital status, uh, we had uh, more than half of them who were single and quite representative, whilst we had a few of them who were divorced and others. With regards to economic activity, like we've seen from the national census data, majority of the respondents were employed in the private informal activities, which employed close to 60, 50% of the entire population. And so we were not surprised as to whether or not the representation was fair in the study because there were other data items that confirmed this. Other variables include education, at which I will gloss to quickly look at the core subjects of the area. So the question is, what items distract Ghanaians or respondents in Accra when going about their various working activities? And from the list of the ranking, we noticed that the top three of the 10, which actually distract a lot of Ghanaians or respondents within the study, had to do with digital technology or digital innovation. And so if you look at the list, listening to music on phone was the topmost activities 
by respondents agreed to as one of the key items that actually distracts their attention from one time to the other when actually walking within the central business district, whether walking along the sidewalk, crossing the street, or moving to any destination of their choice. The second activity the inclined or related to digital technology had to do with making or receiving of phone calls, which was 75% um, of all uh, ranking. The third had to do with conversations with people other than making phone calls. And the fourth activity had to do with browsing the internet whilst walking or browsing the internet for various activities. And this is quite familiar with a lot of young folks within um, um, our um, central business district. As mobile phone penetration in Ghana is close to 110%, and mobile data usage has also gone up significantly, making claims of people's use of internet on a regular basis across the spectrum. The other list of activities that um, respondents agreed to as not engaging in on a regular basis had to do with, if you look at the bottom three, reading books and newspapers, which I wasn't surprised. It wasn't a functional part of the everyday Ghanaian within um, the study area and within the country at large. Tuning to the radio, which was also not functional. And also watching a lot of electronic billboards. And if you are familiar with um, Accra, you notice that um, unlike New York, where you have a lot of electronic billboards, these were not a functional part of um, Accra and were not um, very prominent and common as compared to. And so we're not surprised to see these activities as the least or the bottom three, whilst digital innovations and phone calls and use of mobile technology sought to be the key things that actually distract Ghanaians when walking and also gives us the opportunity to explore various activities for which we can use to care and also reduce the risk of exposure when young folks or otherwise are actually walking within. Then the next part of the study sought to look at um, the various extents to which Ghanaians or respondents actually engage. So this is a ranking. And the extent of that also took the approach of a binary logistic regression where we use the odds ratio to actually explore the extent to which our respondents were more likely to also engage in these activities from the field. From the logistic regression, our entire model recorded um, a good Chromeback alpha of 0 0.73, which we thought was relevant and also above the minimum threshold for um, a good logistic regression. But if you look closely at the entire model, you notice that the most significant items have been highlighted in green. And for us, it was a key concern to also explore. Some of them were obvious, others were not so obvious. For instance, um, the likelihood of males engaging in these destructive activities was 2.3 and quite significant. And if you look at other similar literature, we were not so surprised because males were more likely to engage in more riskier and quote unquote, some careless activities. So we were not surprised males in Accra were more likely to engage. However, if you look at the age category, we were also quite intrigued to realize that respondents between 27 to 37 years were almost 13 times, oh sorry, were 12 times more as likely to engage in these activities. And for us, this was quite a concern because this age range comprised the most economically active population group. And for that matter, questions we sought to ask ourselves is, what exactly are we putting or what exactly are we, how exactly are we planning our environment if the people who constitute the economically active group are those who are more likely to also engage in these destructive activities? For which reasons we may have to look at ways we can actually plan to also look at the environment. Others also include um, educational activities, which also proved to be very high when it comes to engaging them. And so people who had senior high school education, which was close to um, 12 years of formal education, that is a step below university education, were also quite high when it comes to the category of people who were more likely to engage in them. And it was also a matter of concern, particularly if you look at the population structure and economically active group. These are the people who are more represented. They were the people who are more known within the informal sector. And these are people who also have a lot of earnings, for which reasons we also wanted to raise a flag and also generate a conversation 
to also look at this particular group within the planning scheme. Then we also looked at occupation. And like I said, it was more particular of people within the informal sector as they recorded about 13 times more the likelihood of engaging in this, as well as those within the private formal. But what we also realized was that within the Central Business Institute of Accra, career services have also become a booming activity now. And for most part of the most residents there, using a vehicle to also cut goods from one place to the other became non-productive because you spend a lot of time in traffic. And for that matter, people would also waste a lot of time in getting the items. For which reasons, people have started walking as a, the best way possible to also get goods delivered from one place to the other. And so if you look at the reasons for which people walk, the study realized that respondents who also consider working as part of their daily job routine, and largely people who were in the career service and resort to working every day, had a good chance to also engage in these destructive activities, giving us more concerns to worry about uh, people and how they also engage in what they do. Others include time spent in working. And from here, we can realize that people who work between six to 10 hours raise concerns, but it wasn't so high for us to worry about ourselves. And largely, working or duration spent in working did not present much of an issue. Because if you look at the odds ratio within them, they were quite less than one and not much of an issue for us to concern. The other issue that I also want to want us to raise has to do with working time for common trips. And this is finally the last issue. And if you look at it, you realize regardless of how many minutes an individual will spend to work within the central business district, it was likely that the least amount of time spent, the least or the likely the opportunity for these respondents to actually engage within or to actually engage within this various destructive activity giving us reasons to believe that no matter what people do, whether they work for five minutes or 10 minutes or 60 minutes, it is quite common and easier, judging from the odds ratio, for Ghanaians and respondents to likely engage. So the questions we keep asking ourselves is, if all of these things persist, what exactly can we do? How do we generate a conversation to target these demographics? And how exactly can we make the central business district more safer and also restrict people from engaging in these activities. From my recommendation, I, con I conclude that, or the team conclude that, the National Road Safety Commission and virtually the city planners should intensify public outreach programs to also ensure a safer pedestrian culture within us, and also consider distractions as ways that can also increase our likelihood or risk to crashes or injuries, because it takes two to tango. If the driver is safe, 100% and also abide by all traffic rules. The least carelessness or the least distractions on the part of the pedestrian can also expose them to some level of risk, for which reasons we want to advocate for a safer pedestrian culture and also look at ways for which we can also look at ways for which we can also look in reducing the various distractions, particularly when it comes to controlling the use of mobile phone use, the use of the sidewalk for commercial activities and others. These research findings I have displayed has never been exposed or written in details in two um, um, publications or two portals. There's a research paper on the urban planning and transport journal, and also a thousand page abstract, which we did on the conversation, for which you can also read for further details and also insights on what we've done. Thank you very much for your time. And this ends my presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Kwame. I think after this, I'm going straight to read your papers. It was quite an insightful presentation. To discuss the presentation is uh, Rajena Gitao, who is an urban planner and budding researcher, passionately paving the way for equitable urban mobility in African cities. She has four years of uh, hands-on experience in shaping urban landscapes through research and uh, planning in East Africa. Her primary interests revolve around advocating for inclusive transport solutions that leave no one behind, specifically marginalized groups from gender and uh, disability groups. Additionally, she is passionate about delving into transportation planning with a keen eye on how to finance sustainable transportation projects. She earned a bachelor's degree in urban and regional planning from Maseno University in Kenya and is currently working towards a master's degree in infrastructure planning at the University of Stuttgart in Germany. 
Alongside her academic pursuits, she is a proud participant of the fourth cohort of the SLOCAT VREF Young Leaders in Sustainable Transport Program. And uh, when not immersed in urban mobility, you'll find her exploring the great outdoors as an ardent hiker. Uh, Regina, the floor is yours, and we would like to hear your insights on Kwame's presentation. Thank you so much, Robert, for the introduction, and hello, everyone. I'm glad to have this opportunity to discuss Kwame's incredible work. I really did enjoy uh, reading it, and I think it's a, a really um, necessary kind of research, especially now that we are trying to promote active mobility. I'm just going to highlight a few things that really did catch my eye and probably seek Kwame's clarification uh, on a few issues that I thought uh, didn't come out clearly. Uh, when I really did like the contextual relevance, uh, especially in Accra's uh, CBD, because I feel like it recognizes the uniqueness of urban landscapes, infrastructural challenges, and social cultural factors of all African cities that definitely affects uh, pedestrian behavior. And I feel that this contextualization really um, makes the, uh, the study replicable. Uh, it can be replicated or applied in other African contexts and it also uh, highlights our uniqueness and the unique experiences of African cities from those of uh, the West. Uh, I like the methodology. I think it was my favorite part, how he Combined the um, survey and the logis uh, the regression analysis, and I feel like it kind of strengthened the findings. However, I would like Kwame to kind of clarify on a few issues that I'm curious about. Uh, it seems that three of the top four destructive behaviors are from poor usage, and I would like to know whether it was intentional to uh, separate them uh, in the questionnaire rather than generalize them uh, as phone usage uh, in them. In data collection, was it um, intentional or what was the rationale behind it? Second, uh, it seems that your research didn't uh, incorporate qualitative methods such as focus group discussions, and I feel like the qualitative methodologies would have really enriched uh, the insights or the kind of like dynamics we would have gotten from their research, especially from the gender perspective. Why is it that men are the ones who are invo involved in risky behavior? I know you had highlighted in your paper that um, you know men love the thrill and the adventure of. Uh, you know, participating in risky behavior, and that's why they are. Uh, that, that's why the study shows that. So I think it would be interesting. Why is it not women yet? Women are also in the city. So I think it'd be nice to really hear about that. That I think it's also about the findings. Uh, yes, again, about the men and the gender issues. Uh, I I would like to know whether these um, findings coincide with the statistics on the uh, on road accidents in Accra, or is the gender. Uh, is a data agenda aggregated in terms of, you know, uh, more men uh, involved in road accidents? Is do the results um, kind of align with the data that is already existing on road accidents? Lastly, it's on policy implications. I felt like there was so much that we could really draw from the rich findings of your study, Kwame, and I came with I came up with a few that I think would have been a great addition to your study. Uh, one, it's proper street addressing. You do mention that most of these people who are involved um, in this kind of risky behavior or destructive activities are informal business people who are either courier services, they are their messengers, or they deliver. Um, they, they are trying to find their customers, right? And I feel like it's, a, it's on a personal level, like as, a, as an avid online shopper, most of the same in the CBD, I use my phone to find like the delivery guy. So, and I'll always, I have to be on my phone because if he doesn't find me, he doesn't find me and be, he, I have to keep telling him, yeah, it's me, I'm on the phone and I'm waiting such and such. So if this proper street addressing really, we could um, buy on out like half of the problem. Second, I think also the public uh, the public outreach programs, I think they should also be agent gender specific so that we can try and tailor the message uh, to fit like these specific uh, demographics. Uh, that is the integration of rate safety education. I know um, the study shows that most of these people do not have uh, a higher education past secondary school. So why not make sure that road safety education is incorporated in the basic compulsory education system to ensure that whether you decide to involve yourself to formal or informal um, 
business after school, you do have like the basic road safety knowledge. Uh, lastly, it's proper design of public spaces, really. Our city is that boring that I'd rather be on my phone rather than interact with the city, really, you know. So I think it's also a call to us as planners, how are we design in public spaces? Are we forcing people to actually distract ourselves because maybe the facades or the city is so boring and chaotic that I'd rather be on my phone? So... Yeah, I think that those are all my answers. I really did enjoy your paper and I can't wait to see it replicated in other cities, especially my city, Nairobi. And yeah, I can't wait to hear more insights from the participants. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, can I respond? Uh, uh, just a moment. Once we open open up the plenary session, then we'll give you all chances to, to respond. Um, I think, first of all, let me just thank uh, all of you for those three very informative presentations, as well as the discussions for making some time and giving us some insights into what the presenters have given us. So it's really quite interesting to see that uh, challenges for pedestrians are, or, or in different contexts are experienced generally across the whole region. And I think we have to engage further to see how some of these solutions can be transferable as well, perhaps contextualized a bit uh, within some of our, our countries and possibly regions as well. So I will open up the floor for some questions. We have uh, 30 minutes for some questions, but firstly, I'll then uh, give the presenters an opportunity to present or to respond to some of the questions that were raised by the discussants. So Kwame, I think you are raring to go. So I'll give you the floor yes, to start. Yes, um, <laughs> that, that was a lot of comments. <laughs> okay, so let, let me take them. Um, so it was deliberate on the part. So this is not, um, so there's a research team, my mentor, Professor Inoxam, myself and another colleague. And there was a deliberate attempt to actually separate the ranking of activities from the extent to which they engage in them, just to give us um, um, a quick view of what it is that distracts them before going deeper into a more inferential analysis of the extent to which they engage. I agree with you that um, having um, a qualitative approach to the research could have given us a deeper insight to some of the findings um, uh, key issues on gender and other variables. I agree, um, um, that's a limitation. We have actually made um, attempts to, in fact, so we had uh, a partner from Israel who showed interest and wants to upscale the study across Ghana and Israel for a comparative analysis. And the qualitative approach has been one of the key things that has come up. And so we have taken that into consideration. Uh, I'm not sure I remember the rest, thank you. <laughs> No, thank you, Kwame. Um, uh, let me give the other two presenters perhaps a chance to respond to some of the issues or comments that were raised by the uh, discussants. Uh, Jonathan? Okay, thank you, you, Robert. Thank you very much, Robert. All right, so uh, the response, uh, the feedback from... Um, from the discussion, what I would like to say here is that I, I think uh, I take into consideration trying to narrow down some of my objectives because being on the field gives me an insight that it's going to be a very huge work and I think it's better for me to also reduce it. So I'm in discussion with my supervisor to find out how best we can narrow some of the um, objectives so that it will be focused because it's also time bound uh, with my work. If I'm not careful, I may end up spending so many years working on it and without getting a particular clear vision. So uh, I'll take that into consideration. And also with the aspect of using more computer versions of uh, more using more technology in my uh, my work and my data collection, I think it's true. Uh, take, if I only do that if I'm able to um, focus and also re-engineer re my objectives to focus on what I really want to do so as i mentioned it's all boils down to my supervisor and also uh, his acceptance and also how we would like to go about it right thank you thank you jonathan i think um the comments that were well received and i think going forward uh it seems like you will use those to perhaps polish up and then 
hopefully come back and present to us again. Um, Polycap, would you like to say a few words in response yeah. to that? Okay. Thank you very much, Nami Ratsi. Yeah, permit me if I don't pronounce the name well. Okay, thank you so much for your comments. I think one of the major worries you were you raised was whether we are actually going to continue this study in other cities to actually uh, be able to have a better understanding in terms of maybe a comparative analysis. And the answer is yes. Currently, I am in Cameroon, and uh, of course, I am already doing the second study here in Cameroon, struggling to 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 see how I balance the case of uh, Kigali, Rwanda. Like when we look at in more keenly, you did discover that Kigali may seem to be doing well when it comes to pedestrian infrastructures in terms of their design. They are actually understanding the needs of pedestrians and trying to put that into practice by providing some facilities uh, to pedestrians. However, more work is still to be done. And of course, in other African cities, just like you said, there is a, a lot of relationship with uh, the research that has been coming up. I think many other people have described African cities as unworkable cities with people who actually work. And when we look at the case of Kigali too, we discover that it's almost the same, a greater proportion of those we actually interviewed indicated that working was their dominant uh, mode of transport with some even uh, in, uh, reporting working for more than seven hours, which was quite actually surprising for us. And, uh, this just comes into play to actually to actually support uh, previous findings on working in the sub-Saharan African context, which shows that working is not just a transport, uh, maybe a transport option, but maybe an, a mode that is highly valued with many people actually engaging in this transport sector. So actually, we are struggling to see how we actually cover the other case study cities uh, Bamenda and hopefully in the nearest future, we will be getting to Cape Town to actually equally compare the analysis there because Cape Town like we did uh, raise in the research design is actually more tilted towards motorized highways where we have large highways with the roads largely designed for cars with little uh, attention to pedestrians like on the image that I actually showed where you could see a, a construction worker on a highway road, which actually was surprising too. So we are looking forward to actually see how we balance up the study by doing a comparative analysis with other African cities to, to have a better understanding on how roads actually impact pedestrians. And then there was equally a question on the chat box, just permit me to actually use the opportunity and answer, asking whether we actually uh, take took note of uh, informal activities within a particular period of the day, considering the morning, afternoon, and the evening periods. Actually, that we did not actually do that. We actually observed the activities that were close to the roads, uh, mostly within the morning period and the afternoon period. And in the evening, uh, we actually did not go to the streets, but I, in person, we tried to find out whether in the evening the situation was actually different, whether people take advantage of the evening and come to the road to actually carry out informal activities when maybe the authorities, the state authorities who actually survey the road to see that there are no informal activities are going on. And most of the respondents, they, they were positive that such is not happening in Kigali, that there are actually no informal activities even in the evening along the streets. I hope I've been able to answer the questions that were raised and directed to me so far. Thank you. Thank you, Chebe. I think you canvassed that uh, yeah. or the comments quite properly. Um, I'm just checking through the chat and I think there was a comment by Yana Tumakova, uh, which Kwame, I think you took note of in terms of uh, while it's open for scientists to research on any topic, we should be aware and careful of how our research might be used and framed. For safety of vulnerable road users, pedestrians particularly, we should avoid uh, victim blaming. The pedestrians are not killed because they are listening to the music or talking to another person while walking. They are killed by the different uh, drivers of motorized vehicles. So the impact of vehicles on speed, that is what's killing the pedestrians. 
distracted behavior of drivers is also uh, much more risky because of the impact that cars they are driving might cause to the people and the environment. Um, I think that's uh, a good perspective as well, and yeah. perhaps just a different way to look at it and just to show that as much as we need to focus on pedestrian behavior, we also need to make sure that drivers are equally aware of the environment that they are uh, moving in. Um, so the floor is open for questions. We, I think we, if you can't uh, speak, you can post your question and then we'll uh, read it out to the presenter. Otherwise you can just unmute and then uh, speak to us. Exactly, yeah. Feel okay. free to, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, it's just been a very good time listening to all the presentations. I just have a few reactions. You don't have to answer. You can look at them later. For the first presenter, how did you operationalize the term enough pedestrian walkway? What is the operationalization of enough pedestrian walkway? Were they just looking and saying that these are enough? It is, it is normally important for a study to have a particular way they are defining or operationalizing certain terms so that each, each person who is responding is responding to the same thing. They, I'm also wondering how the status of neighbor, neighbor, neighborhood sidewalks were, were, were defined or were, were, gotten, were, were focused on in terms of, did you use uh, the PLO for this or what did you use, like the uh, pedestrian level of service to know the status? Another question is uh, the street audit. I know this is something that you intend to do, what are you intending to get from such, from the street audit? And also, I have the same comment in line with the, you're having so much, you're biting so much. For example, you have so many theories and so many theories in an academic paper will always stretch your work to many, many directions. And I, my suggestion is that you narrow them down to a few theories that can work for your study. For presentation number two, uh, it was not clear what your research design is, and uh, you know, without a clear research design, also it ha it's hard to understand how you um, navigate your study. And do you think that uh, the theories that you are using that are actually north based are going to be applicable in your study that is south based? For presentation presenter number three. Uh, I also need to understand, not now, of course, destructive walking activities. How are they conceptualized? What is a destructive walking activity in that study? And uh, in your conclusion, I, I, I expected to hear something like legislation on how, on use of uh, phones, especially when crossing the road in Kenya. At some point, we had to have the council, the, the city council try to, uh, distract to stop people from using uh, phones as they cross the roads. Thank you very much. Ah, thank you, Gladys, for those very, very detailed comments and uh, questions. Um, would anyone want to perhaps respond to, to those just briefly? A uh, quick one or two words. Uh, Jonathan? Okay, okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Gladys, for your observations and also questions. All right, so uh, I'll start from the base. The last question is looking at uh, narrowing down the work to a particular... Uh, it's true. Uh, um, I think I'm beginning to acknowledge the fact that uh, my work is very broad and it's actually derailing my attention from so many things that I'm looking at. At a point, I need to question myself that what exactly am I doing? What exactly am I trying to do? When will I even finish with this? So it's part of the considerations I'm having now, as I mentioned earlier, that I would like to narrow down and also try to limit the, the objectives to exactly what I really want to do so that it will become clear. Uh, when it comes to the street audit and what exactly I want to look at, I'm actually looking at this the, the nature of this uh, infrastructure that has been provided as to what are they where it's supposed to be? Are they existing? Uh, what are the conditions? 
uh, are they there just because of being there or what are the conditions of this uh, infrastructure that has been uh, come up with? So I have so many designs that I, I'm trying to put together to work on this. Uh, I, frankly, I've not started with the street auditing yet. Uh, I've not actually looked deep into it. And also concerning the theories uh, that have been mentioned, uh, it still comes down to the fact that the theories, as we mentioned, will, uh, when I begin to narrow down what I really want to do, it will help me to uh, know which theory I should really focus on. But I think the, the foundation and the backbone of what I'm actually doing is, is based on the theory, uh, the theory of reason action, which I think I need to touch on it. And when it comes to the operationalization of uh, the definitions, yes, uh, looking at the density, how, do I, what do I mean by it? So Nathan, are you still there or have we lost him? Sorry, Anthony, please, hear uh, you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm back. Yes. Is it my side? Yeah, I'm back. Please, uh, please can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, I don't know where I left for. I left off anyway, but uh, I think. Uh, Please can you remind me where I left off so that I can... By the okay. operationalization of... Uh, in okay. Operationalization of the definitions. Okay. All right. So, uh, operationalization of the definitions. Uh, what I mean over here is trying to look at what do I mean by the density uh, or so much people... Uh, so much. We are looking at um, taking into consideration the population and also um, the availability of non-motorized transport. A system a infrastructure that is the system so that was leading us into the definition but actually we are going by i'm going by the, the traditional definitions that we have for side walls and also uh, other definitions that i've mentioned in the i don't know what i've made simply yes no that that's quite clear thank you jonathan uh i think just a few uh questions and perhaps clarifications for polycap um there's a question from jane margaret uh was research ethics considered with regards to using the images and then another one for you is that uh can you throw more light on the indicators you focused on to assess the road environment polycap okay. i think make those two yes. okay Th thank you very much okay thank you very much i think the question ties with what gladys was asking me concerning the research uh, design. Thank you very much, Gladys, for the time constraints that we had for this presentation. I did not actually uh, dwell more into the research design itself. My interest was just to throw more light on what we actually found mostly and the findings itself. So actually for the research design, uh, we just like as I from the beginning, we have selected actually three case studies which almost have uh, different designs uh, road design practices and in these three case studies cities we actually earmark to actually uh, select two arterial roads that are of thing design meaning that they are not uh, the same it can either be a basic road a more inclusive or high a highway road like those ones that are in South Africa. So we actually uh, earmarked to select two of these arterial routes, and then we select them. We, we After selecting these two arterial routes, we survey them using an observation checklist. And then let me ask the question now, because it will answer the question that what uh, uh, elements are we considering uh, to survey the, 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 the road? So actually, we have an observation checklist which we identify the road design elements which actually influence pedestrians or which impact pedestrians in terms of whether they are sidewalks, there are zebra crossings, uh, there are street lights, and so on. So all those road design elements have been taken into consideration and we actually check them on each selected street to see which one is absent, which one is present, and uh, in fact, from this survey, we are able to identify what, which of these design elements actually serve pedestrians or do not serve pedestrians. And then the second now, the second phase after this survey, using these uh, different road design elements, which I have mentioned, which we uh, have grouped them into sidewalk elements, carriageway elements, and uh, crossing elements, because those are actually the, 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 the three major elements with subs under them that impact pedestrians. After this, now we now 
The second phase is to have a, a survey now, an interview survey with residents, which we earmark to interview 15 residents on each road, meaning that in each case study city, we have 30 interviews that we administer with residents who are living uh, close to these roads in a bit to actually find out how these distinct designs that have been identified, they impact their mobility patterns, their mobility in terms in intensity, in terms of walking distance, walking frequency, variation uh, or diversity in movement, and then equally uh, finding out how it affects their accessibility in terms of the destinations that they are able to reach, livelihood activities, just like with those that they can actually earn living from them. Are they actually livelihood activities along these roads that these people take advantage in order to earn a living? And lastly, uh, livability in terms of social interactions along the place, seeing the road now as a place, not just a link. So those are actually the questions that we are finding out with uh, these uh, respond or with these people who are actually living along the road. And then the second, the last phase of the project now is uh, a focus group discussion, which we earmark now to bring uh, road designers and then uh, and other stakeholders, that's transport professionals, we bring them together to actually share the first two findings that we got in order to, 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 to now equally understand, especially from the designers, what are the reasons behind the distinct designs that are within the cities and then actually uh, equally see how we can deliberate and uh, propose maybe alternative ways in designing roads that can be more inclusive considering different road users that are within the city. So basically that is an overview of uh, what we intend to do. And then for the ethical consideration of the images that are shared, if you we look at in, we actually uh, did uh, an ethical uh, document which was submitted in my host university and even within the city of Kigali where I conducted the first field work, we equally got uh, an ethical approval letter to actually go ahead and then do the survey. I, I did the same here in Bamenda and I was equally issued uh, an ethical approval letter after submitting the documents which was evaluated. So all those things have been taken into consideration. Thank you. I hope I was able to answer the questions. I think you touched on, on both the questions that were asked, which is very good. Uh, Kwame, perhaps just a quick 30 seconds on how you conceptualized destructive walking activities um, in response to Gladys. Thank you. So, a few questions in the chat, so we can use the next three minutes or so, so that we close in time. Thank you. So for us, destructive activities pertains to anything that um, takes away pedestrians' attention from the main activity, so walking. For which reasons we looked at those key 10 items. In fact, the pool was larger, but for the local context, um, these become the top 10 activities that takes our attention, draws us away from keeping our eye on the road and walking towards the destination. So that, that was simply the main focus for which we contextualize the strategy working. Um, for ethics, it's virtually the same as you said. Um, you virtually have to seek before you get it. And it's now a requirement for most general publications. So and that was also done in our case. All right. Uh, thank you, Kwame. Um, just a few comments from the chat box. For Jonathan, I think you might be interested to get in touch with Prof. Johan Eckert from University of Applied Science, Carl Sroha. That's a comment from Yana Tumakova. So please, Jonathan, just check that out. Another question for Jonathan, how did you ensure that pedestrians objectively determine their distance of travel per your categorization? Uh, would you like to have a quick 30 seconds just to respond to that, Jonathan? Okay, perhaps uh, just a question for you to take note and think about. Um, let Robert, me. Robert, there's a question on micro mobility. Has it been responded to? Let me see. Can you pick Is that it up? It's available. Any of the speakers can respond to that. Uh, if not, maybe we can. Uh, 
I think as we do that, as we look out uh, what is being left out, uh, there's a short survey that Karin has shared in the chat. If we can begin um, filling it in as we bring the session to a close. It's been a very exciting, insightful presentation and I believe the presenters, the presentations, the discussions and all of us have been spot on. And I think I said we needed to finish this in style to close the year in style and I believe we've done justice. Robert, over to you. Thank you, Pascaline. I think just to add to that, we have an exciting LinkedIn group for next gens as well. So please head over to LinkedIn, uh, request to join, and we'll accept you to join the community. Or you can alternatively just contact myself. I will share my email in the chat box, or Pascalina will also share her email in the chat box. I think she'll give me the permission to do that. And uh, we would like to thank you all for joining us. Perhaps some words from Pascaline and, and Jane. Wow, thanks. I really like the way Karin says or puts it, do not be strangers, don't be strangers. Please be part of us. And uh, I'm sure we'll meet some of you soon in uh, Cape Town. Come next year. We really want to thank you. We have an upcoming forum that has already been scheduled on 24th of January. Please uh, do not forget to save your date early enough uh, as we close the year. Thank you so much, and it has been a good day or afternoon for us. Jen, over to you. Thanks so much. What a what a what a wonderful session. I mean, so many insightful presentations, and I think the discussions were really spot on with the comments. I've learned a lot, taken a lot of notes. And I think, you know, you can really feel the energy in this room and you can really feel that this space, this session, this format is really becoming a place for people to gather. And it's very clear to me that this is a group that is the next generation of outstanding researchers on the continent in this area. So I'm really energized by today, <laughs> as I always am, but I mean, it's especially today for some reason. And uh I'd just like to reinforce what Pashalan and Robert said, and I'd also thank you both for being expert leaders for this, as well as Clara and for her input, is that we are continue, continuing this series. And as a matter of fact, based on the positive experiences from the Next Generation Initiative in the African program, we will be expanding the initiative to bring in next generation scholars within the areas of walking and informal and shared mobility, because we're realizing that there are many connections here and some of you would benefit a lot from being in contact with other scholars in those areas. So thank you very much. Please join us the 24th of January. Spread the word. Uh, join us on LinkedIn. And uh, as we usually do, right, Robert, Pashala, and Karen, everybody's supposed to come on and wave. So we know that uh, people are here and engaged. And uh, please reach out to us with any ideas or suggestions you have, uh, things you'd like to see more of. Uh, and we'll be happy to, to work with that. So. Thank you so much. Over to you, Pashalin. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Karin. I don't know whether you want to do a, a, a photo for the last one of this year. Please, Please, can you show our cameras? Faces on the screen and I will do a photo. So come on. <laughs> no one should be oh, no one right. should be shy, huh? No. <laughs> Thank you all. So let's get some more people up here. Thank you so much for staying put. We were all at right, five at one point in the room. That is a very good number. And uh, I hope you can spread the message. Yes, about the thank next you. Program. Yeah, bring in all your friends. Everyone is welcome to join. All right. And even thank people who aren't your friends. Bye -bye. <laughs> Thanks well, very much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. And I thank will share the, I will share the recording. Mm. You will have it in your emails. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good night. Depending <laughs> on where you're joining us from. Good morning. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Huh? And enjoy your holidays. Merry Christmas. Bye. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.